It's a great honor and pleasure for me to introduce Dr. Ayanda Simai as our next speaker in the Humanities in Session series that is being hosted through the CHR as part of our advanced research seminar. Um, so this year we've invited speakers whose work in inventive and new ways deals with the idea of, of what we're calling afterness. In the series so far we've hosted Holela Mantu and he's spoke on his work on Tutu and um, Mandela, um, and Sipiwo Mahala, and maybe I shouldn't move my hands. I think that might be the problem. I'll sit on my hands. I don't know if I can talk without moving my hands. Uh, <laughs> Sipiwo Mahala and his work on, on um, Cantemba. Um, and next month we'll be hosting Pumla Gobodo Madikazela and Patricia Parker from, um, well, Pumla from Stellenbosch and Patricia from uh, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. And they're going to be talking about their, pro their, their different projects on the concept of repair in their, in their settings, which is, will be very exciting. Today we have um, Dr. Ayanda Simai, Ayanda, um, who is a recent PhD graduate, having spent a lifetime. See, this doesn't sound as like organic now that I'm doing it the second time round, does it? <laughs> Having spent a lifetime in high school science education. I'm, I'm literally not doing anything. <laughs> There's a pause waiting. Though. It's true, it's true. It was your, you graduated your PhD in 2021. Yeah, yeah, which is, which is amazing. Also to graduate in that time of COVID, which is, as all of our fellows here who've been registered through that time know, people basically lost two years, you know? So she's taught life sciences for 27 years, was deputy chief marker for grade 12 science, a subject advisor for life sciences in the Eastern Cape, as well as a head of Department for Mathematics and Science at both Abeja and Unzon de Delelo High Schools. I understand story is one of immense hope. One is reminded of our recent production on the life of Charlotte Mateke, although obviously on two different sides of the 20th century. Her path was not easy, and I would recommend that people here look up the news articles on her life that can be found on the NMU website. I think it's, I, th I mean, it was an edifying read, let me put it that way. Um, in her teaching and academic work, Ayanda, who is based in the Faculty of Education as a science lecturer at Nelson Mandela University, has focused on mediating between worlds and developing a culturally structured indigenous teaching strategy that would enable a fuller teaching of science in rural areas of the Eastern Cape, but also, and importantly, challenge the Eurocentric views that also structure the way science is taught in our high schools. So it's, it's a, in, in a sense, it reads to me as, an, as, a, as a work of translation in science in some ways, but not just translating into like a science word into isi kosa, but actually how do you take world views and work them together. I'm not going to say too much about this because this is also the topic of your talk today. So Ayanda's work in brief engages with culture, with Hossa indigenous knowledge, rural-based students, language issues of teaching science and sexual concepts, devising indigenous, indigenized teaching strategies for sexual concepts and science experiments. Her community engagements focus on cultural taboos on sexual talk and gender-based sexual violence of young women in local communities. So she has a, a capacious and very relevant oeuvre of work. Um, she, she has presented on this work in, in India, in Germany, and most recently at a, at a um, symposium that was organized by Prof. Andre Keat um, as part of the, um, oh, the uh, exactly, Advancement of Critical University Studies Across Africa, the ACUS platform, that's right. Um, and she's a recipient of several awards, having obtained a scholarship to pursue her doctoral studies through the East and South African German Center of Excellence for Educational Research Methodologies, which is a mouthful. We can call it CERM ESA. I assume that's how it's... <laughs> and under the supervision of Prof. Webb. 
and she received a DAD scholarship for her PhD studies, and most recently won, and this is very important, the Nelson Mandela University Best Dressed Lecturer Award. <laughs> I am sure I have I have um, missed things in a in a very the excellence awards. Oh, the and and um, Dr. Simaya has won the uh, Nelson Mandela University Excellence in Teaching Awards. She's, and as a te I should just say as a small because because no one here except for one person in this room. I believe has ever heard you teach, but her student is also sitting here and drove all the way from Stellenbosch in order to in order to hear her speak again. So, um, if that isn't a testimony to your teaching, I don't know what is. Okay, that's enough from me for now. I'm going to hand the microphone and hopefully it doesn't make too much noise across to Ayanda. Thank you very much, Prof. Marius. Um, let me just start by saying Marius, otherwise the audience should know that you're a professor. I'm so happy to be here today uh, on the invitation of Professor Pramesh Lalu, who had me, as uh, Marius is saying, at the presentation in the ACUS uh, colloquium, talking on the same concept. Then I am quickly, because of time, going to share my screen. I hope everything will be working fine. We've been having some gremlins. So I hope the gremlins won't be playing with me. Can you just confirm if you can see my shared screen? because I've shared on my side. Whilst uh, our tech uh, gentleman is, is checking, I'm happy to welcome um, my students that are logged online, they're very early. They were very early to join in from Nelson Mandela University. I won't mention any, whether it's the first or second years, but they were early. Also, my colleagues, from Nelson Mandela University that also logged in. And as I was saying to, to Marias and also Michelle, the colleagues who are working with me, my family is also part of this. I have seen the Koye neither here, the Fukuza family is here. And also my extended academic family, Kenya is here. Uh, you know, people, they were interested to see how do I interface my way of presenting my work with now UWC, and I'm happy to be here. So whilst waiting for this, uh, for the screen to show, because I'm waiting, also the um, uh, subject planners for the Eastern Cape, if you can see the, the, the person who is responsible for coordinating in the Eastern Cape province, all the subject advisors, um, Ms. Um, Zima Sasanga, she's here because the topic is very pertinent to subject advisors because they manage the life sciences, which is taught in the classroom. And it's natural sciences in grade eight and nine, then life sciences in 10 and 12. And the topic on sexual, not just sexuality, you're not talking about boy, gay here, we're talking about the curriculum. What makes it possible for a grade 12 learner to be able to get a good pass in life sciences? What makes it possible not to get that pass? It boils down to one thing. How is that particular content presented? Now, thank you very much. If you look at that, you see, I haven't been married three times, don't worry about that. But as a, <laughs> but as a cultural person, you know, Marius has touched on that. I had a very tough uh, upbringing. My mom was a kitchen girl. Hence, I'm so close to learners and people who don't have much. I was raised by my, my maternal family. So the Vuguza family that you see there, that's my mom's family. That uncle of mine literally raised me. I'm the last born. I used to go to school in Bafit. It's a story for another day. You should invite me for some time then. I'll tell you. <laughs> All right. Then my mom was married in the Jongi family. But you know the life of a kitchen girl, domestic worker, doesn't look after her kids. 
domestic local looks after somebody else's kids and your kids have got to go and if you're the last born, you're passed around. So that happened. The topic that we're looking into is um, titled A Subaltern Study of Cossa Speakers' Epistemic Views in Post-Colonial South Africa. And the question that we are really asking is that, is menstruation eluded, is it avoided in rural Eastern Cape secondary schools? I'll just unpack a little bit what we mean by the subaltern. For us, it's just that it's coming from these, you know these professors, Professor Premesh Lalu, they go deep into the history. They go deep there. So we borrow their terms and then we fit in. As I said to him, you will look at the deep history part, then I look at my science and culture, then we marry those two. But it simply means that, is it inferior? Because a subaltern is like a sub. Your knowledge in this case, is it inferior? Why is it not showing in the curriculum? We have now been free as from 1994, but I'm talking about my culture because I'm familiar with the Tosa culture. Then we go to other cultures. When you look at science, science is very westernized. The terminology is very Eurocentric. The examples are very, even now the abstract language. But now how do you scaffold Elena? who's coming to a rural space, who has not even ever seen a laboratory. We meet them there, they haven't seen a beaker, first year teaching them science. They're going to be teachers, so I'm moving from that. All right. This one, I have to quickly, do. this is my acknowledgements, I will leave them as they are, the names, I won't go deep, otherwise if I don't do that, I would be dead. But uh, more than anything, my supervisor, I had a very supportive supervisor, Professor Paul Webb. He's English, but like no Englishman. During COVID and log shedding in Kabecha, I struggled in my area with um, electricity connection. He used to say, he's staying in Summerstrand, come over. So I'm part of that family. You don't get that really. You know professors, old professors, they've got money taking students into your home. So I used to stay with the cats in the sunroom, do my work. So we appreciate, so this thing of race, I don't want to say always when you see a white person, when you are black, you think that the race is, it doesn't work like that. My interactions with many people of the other color have been much more supportive and I bear testimony on that. I won't go and repeat all of those, those people who are here are acknowledged. I won't name them. Then let me move because I'm looking at the time and obviously I've got two boys, two lovely boys. One is in Gauteng, see you, the other one is in Cape Town. They have been very supportive, and obviously, my family, my sister was married to Tokeni. Tokeni is also here, the Vuguza family is here. Then I'm gonna move, and the others I will leave as it is. Let me, and also, Maria's acknowledged you, because you accepted the invitation from Prof. Premesh is there. Now, I want this to come directly to what am I bringing to you? And thank you, colleagues, for coming to join the conversation. You have other things that you could have done, but you took time to come and listen. I'm perturbed by the fact that there is a veil of secrecy around sexuality. And sexuality, particularly in women, and menstruation, across cultures, and it becomes more when you come to our cultures. And it becomes much, much more when you go to deep rural villages. My research, I didn't do it here around Pedi because I'm coming from Pedi. Pedi is a small town with rural villages just before you, you pass Grahamstown when you're know, going to East London. That one is better. I went deep down to Ngobo in the deeper Transkai, where when you are traveling, you still see a, a black women and black men, men are riding horses wearing the traditional Tosa attire. And when I stand up, you'll see that I'm a Tosa girl. I, I like wearing these things because it's my culture. And women, they're still not for a ceremony. They're still having those dukes styled. It's their daily way of life. So it means that the tradition is deep. And the teachers who are teaching in those schools, they are residing in the same villages, because they're far from the town center. 
So imagine that so it's a homogeneous community of Kosa speaking teachers and learners. But now the teachers may be a bit in terms of a modern life be advanced, but they're staying with them. So whatever they do, they should be cognizant of the fact that this is not done here. They have to teach the sexuality. So this uh, issue of sexuality, which is not talked about, it seems like it is invisible, silent. It causes discomfort amongst community members. And our institutions of higher learning, where we teach teachers to go and teach at schools, is still silent there. And once you look at that, but you see the results of an engaging in that, gender-based violence, pervasive sexual acts are happening. Then there are stereotypes associated with talking about sexuality. Male and female genitalia. It's easy, I think it's easier for English speaking people because it's what they call. But for us, I'm gonna make an example now for people who know Tosa. If you talk about a vagina in Tosa, it's called the Ibenze. But if you say so, you're rude. You can't. You have to use softer terms. They will say, is that is a is a ngo, mongo, mongo, is a cow. Basically, like we feel like then in the traditional times, it was like a, a girl has got to be married, ne? so you're protecting the father's cows, but just think a cow and this. And then some will call it sheep. Sheep is an animal. Imagine a child, little one, who's been abused. What is it going to call this part? Somebody is calling it a, a cow, some is called a gre. There's a slang also, gre. G Q E is a gre. And there is no tangible term. But things are happening. Gender based violence, it perpetually is not stopping, it's escalating through this veil of secrecy. We're hiding these things and it's going on. And then uh, Prof. Lalu, in his edition of 2008, he talks about an epistemic impasse, as if now something has stopped in our knowledge. We have stalled our knowledge, something is not moving. We are now having this particular knowledge from our culture. But since this knowledge is not in the curriculum, we don't have ways of trying to bridge the rich cultural knowledge that the rural learner is coming with to the classroom. So, and then Professor Dean Cross, another one, who was there at the ACS, he says that in the 2012 edition, there is a need to reimagine both access and the quality. This is where I am, the quality of the science that we are teaching in the education faculty. So that these teachers, when they go to school, they should know that don't just grab a textbook, put slides and read the content interface, introduce a, le a lesson, then try to bridge the gap between the learner's environment. The literature, I won't go much, but as a researcher, you know that I'm surrounded by docs and professors here. They must know that we ground our reasoning on, on literature. It's not just all in my head. I just taken <laughs> these excerpts. I won't go deeper, but I, I tried. What do you mean by sub-alternative? Then uh, it's exclusion like feeling inferior, your knowledge is not recognized. So I took it, it's not, it's not like that in his definition, but I applied it in my own study to have meaning. Then there's a question, are we really in post-colonial South Africa? Or are we still transitioning? Because it's 29 years. If we say we are in post-colonial South Africa, this, we should not be talking about this. We should be having our own examples in the textbooks that we are having in schools. But we're still having the old examples that do not cater for the learner who's coming from a rural space, strangled by language, strangled by understanding, because what is taught now at school and at university doesn't make sense. Then lastly, Prof. Kit. 2014, we need a social justice praxis. We cannot just stay, say, ah, let, let them stay like that, no. They are already marginalized. 
by the places where they stay in. So we cannot, now that they have reached, they've accessed the higher learning institutions, then teach as if all of them are the same. So what I do is that when you look at the manner in which science is, science is so conscripted. Science has got abstract terminology and it's dominant. So I try to ground science. Nothing else, the, the one which is in the textbook, ground it with the relevant indigenous knowledge. And that is mine, you won't find it anywhere. I'm writing some things, this one I'm going to share with you colleagues, it's in my PhD. But I'm in the process of writing mini booklets so that students, when they go and teach a lesson, because what I'm saying is covered in the CAPS curriculum. If you look at the grade seven, eight, and nine, the senior phase, the three specific aims for science, they talked with three things. Doing science, that is having a practical. Secondly, ensuring that learners know the new subject content, knowledge, and they link it with their environment. Then the third one, these two you can easily do. The third one it says, the new subject content knowledge should be linked to the indigenous knowledge of the people and society. And then my students ask me, then, it's not there in the books, how do we do it? This is where I come in. I think you're gonna like me because I'm gonna tell you that next time I'm gonna be happy, but I'm not going to share much with you. So, because I don't want you to be getting so much of me. <laughs> so I'm just like, tip, tip, you know, a dropper, tip, then so that you can say, come again, tip, all right. To show you what I'm talking about, this one is coming directly from my PhD is to draw to your attention that the teachers are suffering. My methodology that I use, they're participatory. Not just only focus group, they have to do drawings, their pins, and write. That one is so subjective. No names, huge just numbers. This particular teacher, if you look there, the teacher is saying, when I have to teach about a penis, this is a teacher, direct raw data. When I'm teaching about the penis to male students, I always feel like a wilted flower. There's the drawing of a flower. Because they feel offended if you call words like penis. Then how do you teach it when you're going to call penis a penis? Because traditionally, circumcision amongst the Kosa community is a secret. If you're a woman, you don't enter in that space. You are a life sciences, a natural science teacher. What do you do? They're facing a problem. Homogeneity, and they know that you're sharing the same culture. You know, one other teacher said so, that a student stood up in class to say, ma'am, what you're doing is wrong. You know that females, in fact, women, don't talk about that in class. So they're facing a problem. Then for the teachers that I was with, the grade 12 teachers, they know their stuff. They know, they know their science content knowledge. Because I took these particular areas which fall under the human reproduction uh, content in grade 12 from the CAPS diagram, I mean CAPS document. Then I had a professional development and the way they were responding, because you don't just throw in people, because mine was a participatory study. I went there three times, because I wanted them to take ownership of the study, not just test them and go. The way they interfaced with the content, and some were even markers, they knew their content. So it's to say that the Eastern Cape teachers who are teaching in the rural, scale, in the rural schools, they may be having low pass numbers, it's not that they don't know the content. The challenge is how to teach the content when faced with these circumstances. But on this side, the government is doing its duty because, it, and parents as well, they want their kids to pass regardless of the conditions. They don't, they don't care about the conditions. But what then do we do? I'll, I'll leave out the, the theory. Now I come to this one. 
So finally, when I looked at this, I felt like there are some uh, programs, I want to put them as programs, or cultural practices that were done in my time, which I know. And it was so nice to see that other colleagues didn't know, although they were in the same age group, same culture. So I called them the Primitive Cultural Counting Program, in short, PCCP. I'm going to stand up because uh, I want to, to show what I'm doing. What I did was to first look, so I need to have this one up a bit, was to first look at how did the teachers clarify the concept of fertilization and sexual intercourse. It's not the same. It's not the same. But you'll be surprised if I can show you, because they are so scared of talking about it. One teacher in the drawings just said, fertilization is when that thing of the male gets into that thing of the female. What is that? First, that is not fertilization. That is what? That is sexual intercourse. But even sexual intercourse must have a penis and a vagina. Not that thing and that thing. So the way they are so scared of offending these learners and their parents, they end up bungling or even just leaving them there because they get challenged. They're even proposed. When they come from school, one would say, you taught that thing, can we continue what you were doing? They try to tell them. Now, I hope I am going to be visible. So at home, my rural girl, as you have said, I came with this in my play, Michaela and Michelle, they know, and Marias, because I said I wanted to have some burnout. And you know, I'm an, an, an active person, I show what. And by the way, there is Awanke Sitabai. This was my PGC student last year, my very best one, one of the best. And then uh, he got um, the Mandela Rose, the prestigious Mandela Rose scholarship. I was one of the people who recommended him. <laughs> yes. A very resilient young man. He is here at Stellenbosch University doing the MPhil. When he heard that I was coming, he said, no, I can't do online, Doc. I'm going to be here. So I sent him a location. Now, as a village girl, this is a fireplace. So this is the burnt out coal, the remainder, ne? like people over here. So this is um, the fireplace that you are having. Then what happened in the olden days? I'm going to say this, this smaller one is a mama, this side. Ne? This, let's say this one should be bigger. That is always stronger, the father. Anyway, this is the father, the side. I'll leave the key. So there used to be a fireplace in the Ronda Ball. Ronda Balls had a stick which was holding the roof. Then when the fire dies down, then they're sleeping down on, on woven reeds. Nope, no, not these mattresses. So on this side, the mama. On this side, the father. Then the fire dies down. Maybe the mama has got some little babies here that is big and blue ones here. The mama has got babies. Then at night, when the babies are sleeping, the father says, Hey, Nobuzola, move over. Nobuzola is the name of the mama. Ne? Move over. The kids are sleeping. Then when the husband, because authority in our cultures, women, Listen to men. It was like that then. I can't say that now. We're free, Mosne. It can't be we're free. We're free. Now, the mama, the mother, will jump over the fireplace to the father. In Tosa, it's called Ukutsiba Iziko, jumping over the fireplace. What they are going to be doing is to be having what? Sexual intercourse. Because they're planning to have what? Babies. Why do we have to think, like I, why do I have to think about this? It's because if you cannot teach and talk about sexual intercourse and fertilization, then how are we going to explain? So when you start like, like it was there culturally, 
So it sits well. Even when the student goes back home to report, the teacher was not teaching something vulgar. It was done. Let alone that they know that kids are there, they're made. It was done. It's in the cultural heritage of the Tosa people. They were jumping over the fireplace. Ukutsiba is That is the first part. Now, and this part had got timing. They were so orderly. That is the second part now, the second part of this uh, PCCP of ours. When the lady or the mother was having menstrual periods, there was no jumping off the, off, off the fireplace. And we are teaching our current girls and boys that when you are menstruating, you don't go and do sex. They do it. We read on Twitter. It's not right. But we're not saying that it is something which is uh, uh, like dead. You know, church used the term where you find that women who go through the menstrual cycle are unclean. You can't, even if you have a certain authority in church, you can't go to a temple. It's not about that. It's about hygiene, personal hygiene. So even in the culture, when the mother was having the menstrual periods, she was not jumping over the fireplace. So it's educational and it's a, it's a moral lesson that we get for the young ones. Now the next part is that this menstrual period. So the jumping. Here I have plants. We couldn't scoop out the grass, ne? but we have something which is looking like grass. What happens? during menstruation. Because they said that males, the topic that was identified in the study to be the most difficult to teach was menstruation by both males and females, young and old. The menstruation, how we can teach that? Then how do you break that barrier? Because they need to know, because there's nothing wrong with menstruation. Everybody who is here, president or whoever, came through menstruation. Women must menstruate to do what? To produce new excels. I'm coming to the science part. But first we lay out the significance of interfacing the indigenous knowledge, which some didn't even know. So this is grass. But in this case, we've got plants which are representing what? Grass, because we are, we are in Cape Town. You know Cape Town is so posh, so we grab. <laughs> If, uh, if we were in Mandela, we would have scooped uh, grass anywhere, but here yeah, you've got even the typical names of the plants. Fine. Thank you. Now, you see, when you lift the grass, so we assume that it is grass, ne? you lift the grass. What, what's happening? The soil is falling down. Soil is falling down. They are lifting up. So when you talk about menstruation, it is the uterine lining, which is called the endometrium. So during day one to seven on average, some take three days, five days, but on average, we work on average of seven to make the 28 day cycle. If you hear me talk about a cycle. So this particular grass, which represents the uterine lining, which is the endometrium, is stripped away. You can see what is falling is the what? Is the blood. The blood. Then the blood you bleed, as you see the blood going down. This is the menstrual cycle. Then it's like when you're scooping, then after time, what happens? The grass grows again. These plants, we're not going to throw them away. You're going to plant them back in the soil. They're going to grow. So the uterine lining, it strips from day one to say about day three, then it grows slightly. And then we're going to put in the hormones in terms of life sciences. But as it is growing, also the lining is growing. It's becoming thicker and thicker. So in Kosa, why do I bother about grass? 
We call it engeni. Engeni means to be on the grass. When we directly translate engeni is to be on the grass. So it means that when somebody is menstruating, they know it. Something you didn't know, they know it as coming to that. So when you are on the grass, it's coming from culture. Ah, you say, I am engeni, this engeni. That's the, you saw almost what is happening with engeni. So I am menstruating. All right. So on the grass. So during the grass, no tipping, no skipping over the fireplace, no fertilization. Then others say ekleshen to be on time. On time, ekleshen. On time for what? On time for the removal of the grass. They felt like we know. And then the younger men, you know, I was so pleased to see men engaging with this. They say, we know that thing of being gaming. You know, I'm having my games. They say, games must like playing, ne? but now I think the games is from the time, the period. Like, you know how, how you slang things. So they didn't know about ekleshen, it is particularly the maids. Some females didn't know about ekleshen, it is the grass, but they could see the relevance. And then they said, now we feel that we can do this particular lesson. If we start with this simple familiar stuff, which is grounded in our culture, it makes us easy to talk, it makes it easy to talk about it. Now we moved on. So that is now the part where I say, I'm gonna sit down and then go and look at the terminology now. Then we've done the practical of the Nguyeni, and then they say, I'll, I'll leave the transcript. When it comes to the research world, because you heard me talking about the terms Nguyeni, Ekleshen, because you may be sharing the same culture, but you're using different terminology. Like, for example, when it comes to the penis, some will call it a winky, some a listener, and then in the radio there's a doctor, I don't want to name the name, who calls it a kettle, and I feel like that's a misconception. You know, a kettle for boiling water, and then you, you call a penis a kettle. Then imagine that child, when he's got something, a kettle, my kettle, mom or dad, my kettle is damaged, and I feel like, but he is trying. You see the doctor, an, an MPCHB doctor, you see how deep these cultural taboos are, because oh. if he calls it, because we have untondo in Kosa, this is the precise name, people would really say, you are so rude. Now, based on my study, to cover the different terminology that we used, we have to, we have to use literature. So I tapped into Bakhtin's theory of heteroglacia. You see, culture is unitary. Bakhtin is the Russian scholar up there. And I merged his theory with uh, Oguni, who is the great African, on the contiguity argumentation theory. Because it's arguing uh, Oguni that the contradictions between Western science and our indigenous knowledge have to find, we have to find a balance. But we need to bring each other together. So the hetero, uh, classic perspective of the different names, Engeni and Ekleshen and so on, they had themselves, not me, the teachers had to reach consensus, as I have said, and then said, no, we're taking both, because they make sense, we can understand how Engeni works, we can understand how Ekleshen, because it's the timing, and the lesson, it makes it easier to talk about what? Menstruation, fertilization, and sexual intercourse. And then the multiplicity of language, because somebody is going, especially people who are in the sciences, I belong there, eh, because there's so much into one word, we, are, we dominant, this thing is this. No multiplicity, because if you say one plus one must be two. But I may be saying, oh, yes, I can get the two, but how did I arrive at the two? So the multiplicity and riches the language enriches the concepts and accommodates everybody. It's what he calls polyphony. So it helped me to sharpen this particular program, which is known by others, but not known by others as well. 
So hence I felt that we need to share. Back on this one, I use Atlas TI software to analyze the data. And if you look at that, I won't go much get because I'm not in a research class, but I'm trying to show that there was a lot of congruency in terms of what the participants, because some, some, some responses were individual, some were in a focus group, some and so on. But when you do your coding, they're having similarities. For example, in, and this is a video, there's also a video where they had a teacher, they chose a teacher from one of them to model. Now, after going through the explanation, then they said, one teacher is going to model, not me, to teach using this. They had their own teacher that were recorded, teaching using this. And the men, and also the women, they said, no, it makes it easy. They're not saying it to me, because it's their colleague who was teaching. So, for example, uh, in menstruation, they are affirming that to be on menstruation, if you look at 10.10, .10, to be on time is to be settled. So I can use that. Old people were able to count when to have sex. Because timing, family planning, when to have sex, to have a pregnancy, and when not to have sex. Jumping over the fireplace, we have shown that. And then the women ensured that sex is provided whenever the, the particular woman wanted to be pregnant. And then let me go further now. I want to just move with the cycle without going to the, but I'll leave the screen on. So during the first seven days, in terms of the life sciences curriculum, first days is the stripping and then midway and up, then the endometrium gets ready. Then from day seven to approximately day 14, then you can have sex. The old people didn't know about that, but they just knew that when in men or on time, no sex. When sex is finished, we jump there, the fireplace. And they made sure that men in those days, I think they were very active, I think even the, the women, because they were doing it much more frequent. When I'm hearing, it was much more frequent. I don't know these days, I don't know these days. I don't know. Like, like they knew, they knew, because they were doing it. Look at the manner in which our moms had 10 kids, not so, 10, the olden days, 10, many, many kids. So they knew that after menstruation, let us go and jump over the fireplace. When it comes to science, we say around day 14, 15 is of you, lation. So although they were not schooled, they knew that if it's seven days for menstruation for, for the ecclesiastes, then after the next seven days, I must make sure that I'm jumping over the fireplace. They were not schooled. That is now I'm moving with the what? With the menstrual cycle. Then from day 14, you will hear that in terms of science, the temperature rises up. A woman who wants to get pregnant gets an ovulation chart and the, and the thermometer. They knew in that time, uh, they, they used to be bigger. They would be hitting like this, then they were going frequenter because they didn't know that it is ovulation. But they had telltale signs which confirmed that ovulation was happening. Then after that going down, then they were doing it as long as they were covered after menstruation. So for them, for the first seven days of menstruation, there was no sexual intercourse. Then from day eight up to halala, then they were doing it. Then that is why, that is why they got pregnant. So you are able to teach the menstrual cycle without fear, which is in the curriculum. You, then obviously the hormones, I mean, they didn't know about hormones, obviously there were no hormones, but what happens during menstruation? You talk, of course, the challenge is that when you don't even talk about it, then how are we going to teach it? Then ovulation, then you go and talk about your oxytocins, your luteinizing hormones, because now you are free to lay the ground rules for the explanation of the concepts. And by the way, I'm happy that I'm concluding, looking at my time. By the way, culture is unitary. It embraces everybody. I'm sharing with you the culture that I know, because I can't talk about cultures that I don't know. 
I have a story which I said that I will leave it halfway. I was telling Marias and colleagues. colleagues. The, I've, I've got these awards that I won and I'm proud being first, first time employed, first year, you're getting best in the faculty and best in the university, then you're doing something good. Now, why am I saying this? I was teaching a lesson on technology. And you know technology in science is one that teachers, they don't know it. You, you get students carrying those big things that construct a bridge because they've not been schooled. Very few can do. So with me get doing things, I'm a person who's practical. I was teaching a lesson on technology on energy. So I like to take pictures wherever I go. So I've got a picture from home of an old iron, the iron that you put, my one can know the story, you put the iron along the, the, the fire in the, in, in the coal at home. So you take that one before electricity. We are going back there, by the way, with load shedding, we're going back to the irons. So you take that iron, then you rub it. once it becomes hot, take a cloth, you wrap it on the soil outside and the paper, then this white shirt is going to be ironed to the that. So I was showing the energy changes and so on this young, remember it was online, 2021 was the first year, online. This student sent me a text on WhatsApp, on my student uh, WhatsApp phone at about 11. And in my class, I allow them, because I break English, because English is not my mother tongue. I use a term which says, it runs away, and they know okay, that when it runs away, I say, say, come fit it in, then they will, so they, they are free to say it, so we don't have that thing in that language, you're going to constrict. So if you want to say, you go, we're going to fix it as we go, talk, because we want to get the understanding. Are you following the science? So that when you write, you're going to pass. Now, this young man says that he, at home, when he heard about this, for the first time, culture forms bridges. An African student told Granny, I heard this from doctor in class, said at about 10 at night, they went to the shed. Granny apparently had a better one. Next time when you call me, I'll show you, I won't show you now. A good, I was seeing that iron for the first time took a peek of that iron. It had an, a faded gold um, outer, uh, outer covering. It was small, but you could open it up. And he said that coal or the bent coal, hot, was put inside. And then you close it in the olden days. And then you used to, they say, you used to iron the sleeves. Like, uh, I forgot this thing. Like, uh, in Costa we call it Amazembe. You need this shepherd. They say the Zembe, what is the Zembe is X, Mosne. And they, the, even the English ones say, what, what, what is the shepherd? They don't know. They don't know what is the shepherd when you iron. One said, is the bleed. I say, okay, it's the bleed. In Costa we say, the what is the Zembe, which is an X. So to make that shepherd, you know, it made me feel so touched that this particular student from another culture shared and went in search, took a photo, and then sent it to me. And I shared it in class. And when I went to present my portfolio for the awards, I called him Iron Man. It's there. This year, I saw him. He came, he, he doubles my lectures that many he said, you know, Doc, he mixes gay, he's, he's English, he's just like uh, the English and Africans. Doc, I, I, I double up because it's the interest. So culture is not exclusive. So what is different in what I do is that people when say indigenous knowledge, they think about which doctors, medicine. No, I'm not, I'm not, yes, it's there. I'm not in that. It's about using indigenous based examples in teaching science so that the student was coming from the rural you can see their smiles one that i'm going to make because this one is here just this year i want to tell you my story so much but this year there is um i was teaching the respiratory system you know the problem with the respiratory system when you look at the digestive tract after you slaughtered a cow or whatever you buy it you don't see two separate tubes. It's just one common, and in course, we call it call, call, call. I say it's call cubed, Q-H-O. The advantage with Mandela is that university, all our students, they do Tosa conversational. 
If you are English or Africans first, you do you do Tosa conversational. If you are in, if you are Tosa speaking, you do Africans conversational. So we lingua, so they learn. So and I write, ko ko ko, and I remember how I did it in my own school. I told them the story. I have stories because I know from my villages. I said, you know, when we have maize, when it's the harvesting time, you have maize umbona, which is still in a cob. The cob, you don't think that they know a cob, C O B, that thing, which is like wood. So I explain in my classroom. So when we are young, then the elders would say, after whether it's bright or steamed, give me. And then I asked, do you know what is going to happen? The others didn't. There was this girl, I know. But hey, dog, let me say it in Tosa. He said, say it. And he said it, that they would say, give me, I am going to open the road to your mother's home. You know how they opened the road? They opened the road on the cob by eating, taking, open, taking the maize grains, putting in the adult's mouth. We are waiting there, the mbona, the maize grain is getting finished, and yet the road is opened. In, since I was growing up, and I liked food when I was growing up. I used to, when that happened, hey, this row is getting finished. I used to say, ooh, because we're kids, ooh, you want to get your thing, ooh. And then the ooh, where it is going, the ooh, ooh, usophagus, ooh, usophagus, ooh for food. Because you want to separate the cavities, the tracks, because the other one, the tracky, is for ooh. air. The other one is for food. But how do you differentiate this when in your language you call it one thing, what? Caw, caw, caw. So for me, that indigenous knowledge of the old people who were, that, I was surprised that they're still opening the roads in the villages even now. So when they see me, they say, oh, Usafagas, they will never forget that the Usafagas belongs to the digestive system because of the U for food. And then the tracky belongs to what? To the respiratory tract. This is how I interface indigenous knowledge with the real science, not just talking about stories. Lastly, on my point, the journey so far has been so good, but the problem with culture is that it remains undocumented. So my duty is to document. Hence, I'm saying that. I am on a mission of writing mini, but I'm looking for funding, mini booklets. How do you teach? From my PhD, I extract this particular part. I go to the respiratory tract because it's a link with the indigenous knowledge. And in the process, the students come up with their own ideas. So when they go to the classroom, they have a fast world of knowledge. There ended my presentation of today. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed it. I'm going to put the microphone here. I mean, we might actually need to, can I, I'm just going to take it off. So that we can hand the microphone around for questions. Um, that was amazing. Thank you, Ayanda. We want to also keep it open so that the people who are online. Is the audio was gone? I'm wondering, my goodness. Oh, no, again. They say I was muted. From after one, when I was presenting. Okay, thank you. Oh, that's what I said. It is okay now. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, what we're going to do, if you're happy with this, Ayanda, is um, <coughs> we will open it up for a round of questions questions from people in this room as well as from online and then we'll give you a chance to respond and we'll we'll go we will go like that yes. so
Okay. Yeah, when you hear yourself, ne? Um, anyway, I was just saying thank you very, very much. That was so great and so relevant. I very much work in the space of working with young people and specifically drama therapy, I would say. Um, so these sorts of exercises are things that I do. So to be able to hear them also. And I think what I really re-remembered in hearing you speak is to always, always, and this is one of my favorite things, in doing the work, you always find that the participants give you so much. So you're never writing it alone, is the thing. And that's what excites me so much, is that when we get to go back to these spaces and we start to engage, is that we find there's so much that's already there. Um, so thank you. Hello, um, um, thank you, Simai. My name is Robin um, from the CMDR here at UWC. And um, I wanted to connect with what you're doing with teachers because we have a project at the moment with grade eight and nine teachers. And the grade nine teachers are struggling with exactly this um, reproductive, human reproduction, and this awkwardness. So. My question is, did you in your, in your study work with teachers in writing the multiplicity of terms that you're discussing um, for these different uh, scientific uh, or anatomical um, parts? Um, and, and how did that go down? Because we, we often face a, a bit of a barrier when it comes to literacy in Iskos and English, for example, so the bilingualism works easily on an oral level. How did the teachers respond? Did you try to get them to write these things on the board? And, and how did that work um, in, that, in that context? I'm interested. Thank you. Inkos, ma'am, that was really, really, really wonderful to listen to. Um, I have a question around something that I think you, is, you didn't address, but is, impli is implied in your presentation, which is around um, the structure of education curriculation. Where is the curriculum developed relative to the ultimate site of its delivery? And I think that is, a, it's a big political question around the concurrent responsibility, national and province, but also in your experience and what you're demonstrating now is right down to the level of the teacher's agency. And I thought, I'm interested in sort of hearing your thoughts around how we address that sort of political structural problem around where the curriculation sits relative to where the site of delivery of the curriculum is and the power dynamics between teachers and <laughs> Pretoria. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, colleagues. I hope I'm audible even for the online community. May I get an indication? Let me proceed. The first one was a comment um, where drama is uh, linked to the actual way of teaching the sciences. Then I applaud that because you find that there are so many similarities in drama. And by the way, indigenous knowledge has got lots of drama. I'll show you next time how I teach the structure of the female reproductive system and the structure of the male reproductive system, such that my colleagues, when I was still in schools, they got surprised when they saw my kids doing that. I won't tell you now, but it's for next time. <laughs> Yes, yes, snippets, I, it drops. Now, coming to this, thank you very much for the comments. I'm seeing also online, I won't go right now, let me respond to this which I'm hearing now. The second one to my colleague is that, to be specific, you know research limits you to what you want because my focus was on the human reproductive system in grade 12. I had an idea then that 
these teachers and the learners have gone through, because they started even in primary school. So I was, you know, when you go there, I was of the opinion that they have sufficient vocabulary that is acceptable to be taught. But now having been a grade 12 teacher, both in rural and township areas, and also having been a subject advisor managing teachers, and also having been a deputy chief examiner, I've got here with me the provincial planner Uzima Sasanda, who was a moderator for paper one whilst I was still at school. When we looked at the diagnostics and reports that come for DPE in each year, the section which was being failed in the 2016 and 17 report, which I used as a basis for my study, why am I zooming into this area? Is because the responses are very poor in the grade 12 metric. So we showed that something was not happening. Despite the chats that we're having as teachers that we don't teach it. Some teachers, they just, you know that thing is sex you do and kids laugh, it ends there. So to be precise, we didn't deal with the actual terminology, but when we found that there was a challenge with, call, with calling a vagina, there was no, because I am, you see, I've got so many projects, because I, I am on this line of having a synergy, like amongst the Kosa speaking community, what we call a vagina, such that it is acceptable. Don't call it uh, the cow, the sheep. You see this thing I was talking about. What is the accept acceptable term? Such that um, I wanted to even speak to the traditional leaders because, you know, traditional leaders, they are the holders of culture. You may say that you know no cow, no cow, no what, and then they will say, it's a cow. So if we can have that talk, the conversation, which needs money, to be precise. So we couldn't arrive in that. So this dichotomy which I'm showing here in terms of the terminology exists, but when it came to menstruation, we arrived because we arrived at a definition because culture already has got it. Hence it was easier because they didn't know about the nini, that is the grass, some. They didn't know about the time, some knew. So we had a basis in the cultural knowledge that we use. So I still need to go back now on the second phase, as I'm saying, have a conversation. The traditional leaders, which terms do you think will not be offensive? But not the cow and the kettles, because the kettle which is used for boiling water can never be a kettle which is a penis, because in science that is a misconception for the learner. So to be precise, we didn't delve into that, except this one for menstruation. Then lastly, my colleague, thank you for that input. You could see from my introduction, you know with the government, I'm employed by Department of Higher Education and Training, as us, as you know, tertiary institutions, then our schools are, forming and are falling under DPE. But this challenge is there. We raise, because we're called researchers, as if we're researching things that are not applicable. Teachers, like my colleagues, they're here because they're grappling with these issues in class. Then they have researchers who are aware and have done research into exactly these challenges. But what is the government doing? Is the government calling people whom they think, I'm not saying me, there may be a group of me's, people who are dealing with this, and, and in other fields, can we write something? But now you come to writing a book, whose book, you see the money gets in there. Hence, I'm saying that I'm in the process of doing, but the challenge with publications, lastly on this part, is that schools don't read research papers. Hence, I'm saying that besides publishing, I'm looking at writing mini booklets for the menstruation, for the respiration, like, so that the teachers, if you're going to prepare a lesson on this, you know, this is where we are, but it's going to take Recording some time. Recording in progress. Thank you very much. 
I think now I can take a pause. I don't know whether there's somebody here I can see is dancing and there are also some messages on the online who is going to be responding on that or should I take them and respond? What do you think, uh, Marius? Yeah. Yes. Do you want, do you want me to read it out or do you want to? Or if they want to say something, can they? But they are the messages. Yeah, they can. Sinopia is saying audio, please. Now audio is gone again. It can't be. That's my student is saying audio. Yeah. Okay. Mm, because I, I'm audible. I cannot have both audios. I, can, I cannot have the, the, what's this, the, the laptop audio on and this is going to make an echo. Oh, I'm on now. I think there's a problem with it. Okay. What do you think? Um, I don't know if they want to ask, if, if um, they want to ask the question themselves or if they want to read it out, be given the choice. Yes. It's a longish one. Maybe somebody can raise a hand and share, um, share a comment or something that you want to talk about. We can see that uh, there are some comments that are noted. What do you want to say, perhaps? Zimasa, I can see Mr. Ngulle and others. Messi, your message is here. Prof. Sina, anybody? We are giving over to you to say something. Let me read this longish one because I think the other ones, um, they are commending. I'm going to read this one from Messi. Messi is in Kenya. Uh, awesome talk, Doctor. I understand. I want to go straight to the process. Uh, I really appreciate the place of IK in bringing many concepts to the cognition of learners. My concern is about erosion of culture, speaking for my country. IK is fast losing significance for many of my younger generations. For instance, they tend to have a poorer grasp of tribal languages and their deeper meanings, the norms and taboos, and so on. How do you envision teachers of the African Gen Z and alphas dealing with this same issue? That is um, a message. Whilst in that, there's Sarah. Sarah is on with a hand. We can, I will respond, Messi, after they have talked. Sarah, over to you. Oh, thank you so much, Ayanda, for this uh, great presentation. I'm really learning a lot. My concern is about the indigenous uh, knowledge and science, especially the section on reproduction. Now, when it comes to our Kenyan case, um, we have the names of the reproductive system, the outer names of the reproductive system, both in English and in mother tongue. I don't know how you now went into the deeper inner, like now the fallopian tubes, the uterus. What names did you give in the indigenous language for both the male and the female reproductive system? Because you wanted to bring in the idea of IK in teaching of science so what names because like for our case we don't have a name for like the the internal organs what name we like all that the uterus the, but the outer one at least we shall have a name and another issue also when it comes to reproduction these names yes we know them but we really fear to talk about them in public so how will you talk about a penis, for example, in your mother tongue to your students, in your mother tongue? You know, it's so embarrassing. So how did you bring in the, the two issues? Thank you so much, Dr. Ayanda. All right. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you very much. You are affirming what we have been discussing. Can you see? It's, it's like a universal problem. It's universal. Um, when it comes to the mixing lexicon, because science goes deep, general indigenous knowledge will not talk about fallopian cues because they never knew the internal part. So there's a missing lexicon, for example, in Isikosa, 
when you talk about the uterus, we call it isibeleko, ne? There is no differentiation into ovaries because in terms of science, we know that the ovaries, they produce egg cells, which are now carried deformed in the graphene follicles. Then ovulation is the rupturing of the graphene follicles. They're caught by the fimbra, go into the fallopian tubes. They don't know. They didn't know. They don't know even now, now, what is the indigenous people because that is abstract science. Hence, I'm saying that I'm going to show you, I want to tell you now, because I have a way of making you the drama colleague. N next time, Marias, when you invite me, you then show you, not now, not giving everything, but there is no terminology. There's mix missing lexicon that we have to admit. Because even in class, when you say uterus, it's the whole thing. But in terms of science, when you talk about the uterus, this is where the embryo is implanted in terms of science. But in terms of closer, the whole thing is uterus. So you have to find ways of breaking it down. Thanks for that comment. And then, um, then obviously, yeah, the, the terminology that you are scared is like in us. For me, but still making it, that's why you make it playful. You're softening up because you have to call it, but you soften up with indigenous knowledge. Now, coming to the second question from Messi, it's a challenge that you are having because of modernization, where you find that even our parents, us, the generation of us who are learned, we have kids who do not speak the mother tongue at home. So when they don't even embrace your language, how do you think they're going to embrace your culture? When my kids see me wearing like this, they got used because now I go zoom into my lecture wearing my things. There's no work. Like we call it work most when you have a, 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 a right cultural practice. I want to know. I changed, but no, no, not every day. It was so hot during the early January. I was not donning these things. Now it's getting warmer. I've got lots and lots because you must be proud of what we are. And school kids and my children must know that the value of my culture is in me. We are the holders, the custodians. So if they miss it from us, then they will have nothing. They keep on undermining, seeing that the Western science or Western way of life is the best. Lastly, I'm going to make just one example. Because it's a learning curve, um, a messy like your generation and the alphas. I won't go deep into that, but to say, when we were growing up, young girls were wearing ingrio, is that, it's like this braiding, where you didn't used to have panties. There were no panties in those days, but you had something which was covering this part. You know, this generation of today abused that, and, and we were bare-breasted. That was the culture of that day. But today, the women abuse that culture when they want to go, you know, when most women now, they don't even wear bras, you have seen most. Then they show their dribbling, dribbling breasts. Then they wear their wear wears very short things. And then when we scorn them, what is done in the culture? But what are they taking out from the culture? They're doing all the wrong things. They are wearing like that for all the wrong things because then you were wearing like that because you were a virgin. So it represented purity. But for, so it, it's a long story, this one, but it depends on the particular parent and family where one is being schooled. Thank you very much. Anybody else? Ayanda, thank you so much. Eh? Yeah. <laughs> um, I was just wondering, in some ways it relates to Lebo's question. So I'm just wondering, like, if there is any space in the study of biology with teenagers, um, how might we be faring, just in terms of the plurality of sexuality? That's my, my first question. And then my, um, my second question is, how do we 
kind of work a a gender consciousness into the grounding of the ground, you know? Because there are reasons why our brothers think we are dirty when we're menstruating or, you know, they, you know, that, and, and given the kind of violence that attaches to the process of, of, uh, of sex, you know? Like how, how is science dealing with that when it comes to young people? Thank you very much. That one is a tricky one because it includes even issues of gender diversity. You know, in our cultures, we're so inclusive. When you look, when you study the culture, I'll talk about the Kosa culture. As you have heard, I was raised by my maternal side. We live in extended families where you were treated the same like others. There was no differentiation like this one is going to be best going to sexuality. Even if, as a girl, I was behaving like a, a, a boy, vice versa, they would not be taking, because we're having canes. You were not caned for that. But the older people will go and talk and talk and talk because there were cultural practices. For example, the older girls not to say old, the adolescents, when they were going to enter into the menstrual cycle, there used to be a ceremony where the girls were called and schooled into. And it's common to all cultures, I know in Kosa. But now this thing of the modernization, even within culture, you see this culture as being lower, inferior, this one as being modern in terms of is aligned to the Western way of life. In my thesis, I talk about um, the writings of Piers and um, Kai and Saule, where they're talking about the red causes, because culture can even make a barrier. You are red, like the ones I'm saying that deeply rural where I did my study. And then the modern ones in the story of Funonghause. So there were those who agreed, those who didn't. So that background, that historical perspective of the cultural knowledge and understanding of the Kosa people and other cultures talks to what you're saying. If it is a deeply rural culture, it embraces everybody. When I was growing up, I never heard about these terms that are coming up today. They're coming with modern people. And when I look at it, I had an uncle who never married, and I could see that uncle going hand in hand with another um, uncle, whatever. But it wasn't a talk. Culture used to embrace everybody. But now, with the modern way of life, because certain lifestyles and certain theories and abuse and prejudice has got in such that issues of gender diversity the seen with the eye of labeling people. Like if they are gays, girls, ooh, lesbians, and stubborn. So those terms which are demeaning, which we do not need because culture is inclusive. We are a family. So lastly on this point, when we look also at in the manner of dress, because this thing of the manner of dress is very important. You see these young, you see when you look at young ladies in what they wear, and I'm going to say into class, you teach the reproductive system because the male has got the testes. And then the testes are the male reproductive organs. The actual ones, not the penis. The penis is just a copulatory organ. You see now, when we have laid out the foundation, they're able to go to the basics because they get interested in the tool, in the penis. So the testes, the men have got to protect the what? The testes, we don't always go to the girls. Don't wear these skinny jeans and these skinny pants as the men. Because yeah, we have these tight pants, tight, tight underpants, ne? tight pants. What is happening to your body? The testes are brought closer to the body. The testes have got to be naturally hanging. The creator, whoever is God or the Korah or whoever did it, they were made to be hanging. 
so that they are kept at a temperature which is lower than the body temperature for the safety of the sperm cells. That is science. But they, they don't know it. So when you are bringing it, you are killing your children. I just say it like that. Now, you get married. The victim now is the what? Is there? Is the wife? The wife? You have killed these babies, these sperm cells, because you were bringing them. So be careful. So it's such examples. And I'm happy that my colleagues are laughing because it's true. Such examples. So you have to go to expensive tests and so on for things that you should have avoided. Look at the men in culture. Our men did not, our daddies, I didn't have a daddy. Yeah, I saw them. They used to have that by that thing is like a blanket. Ne? Nothing, not even an actor. They were loose, loose, loose. <laughs> and look at how many kids they were producing. All right? So when you are teaching, you see now, when you are teaching these sensitive parts, you are bringing in the culture. They laugh, it's there, and they've got it. So when, when you're going to assess them, you won't be assessing them about the blanket and the what. Why is the body temperature of the testes supposed to be lower than that of the body? That is the main body. They will know it. They will know it because you have grounded the scientific part on real knowledge. The last one on this one. There's no sound again. I am, um, I don't know. Then lastly on this one, we look at women. Because I don't have to, uh, because I've been hitting women, women, because it's where gender abuse it is. It's so severe. There is this fashion, but it's a necessity because young girls doing grade R and even grade one, we cannot send our kids to grade R wearing panties. That day, in fact, those days are gone. Because they wear panties, they play, kids are playing, then their bummies and their vaginas are showing. The world is bad. So we always, if they're wearing uh, dresses, they have these short tights. Or else they're wearing pants. But you know the danger you're doing. The environment is naturally dark inside the vagina. It's dark. And there are always bacteria, which are good, by the way. Ne? Another lesson for another day. But let me just sum it up nicely before going deep. So when this baby and us are wearing these black tights, they're so popular, the black tights, you are making the environment here to be so preferable for the bad bacteria to grow. Hence, you have young kids who are having trash. And trash, T-H-R-U-S-H, the whitish thingy, even for the adolescents, and it's worrisome for those kids who are growing without their mothers because they are scolded, told that you are sleeping with men. This child is, is baffled with this discharge coming up. No, that child didn't have sex. It's because wearing these tight, protecting things in the dark space, bacteria thrive. They grow so well in dark places. So they are multiplying more than the good ones, producing the what? The, the bad ones. So in culture, I'm marrying this to the Indian when they were going without having anything. But are we saying that they must go there without having panties? Not in this world. But now it means that when we choose the tights, they must not be very tight. Because when they are very tight, you are making, making the environment to be warm and it's much warmer when it's close, it's snuggly, it's much warmer, obviously it's dark in there, so they're going to go much, much more. So look after your babies. When you see them scratching, and even the younger ones when they are sharing, please, they must be taken care of. Don't accuse them. Because when you accuse them, you're sending them to the street. Because little knowledge. Lastly, Marius, because I need to finish up, I'm going to look at this. All right, I'm looking at my student is sharing something. Just to share one personal experience, I think it's what drove me so much into the study. 
At one stage, my mom died when I was doing grade 11. You know, came us, this up and down of mine. Then there is a challenge. We differ in terms of how heavy are our menstrual cycles. So by then, I wasn't aware. I was the type, even if I have pets, I don't want to call the brands, I'm not promoting a particular brand, but those, you know, get from my generation, those brands, they were big like towers, you have to tie them. I had to double up those towel things. <laughs> but, but even then, this thing was messy. You know, the most unfortunate thing, I was coming to uh, Port Elizabeth for the first time to my eldest brother, had a wife, eldest one, for a holiday. This thing happened, hey, what am I going to do? And we're going to go to the first January, on first January, go to the beach. You want to work to the beach. So advice from friends, take vinegar, take vinegar. Because you want thing, this thing to stop because you want to wear bathing suit and I'm coming to PE to the beach for the first time. I don't know whether it was the vinegar or what, because I'm used to having the heavy things, but they were heavier. I ended up uh, having an ambulance called. So apparently it was so heavy. You know, the moral is that now I can say it. Recording but, in progress. But then it was so tough because when I went to the public hospital then, I had to go to the theater to, they had to clean me up. You know what came out? Some of our family members, they are not learned. They don't ask. Once you say you go to the theater to wash, you have done an abortion. I was told that I was done an abortion. And I, to hear this from my late sister, the mother of uh, Mrs. Toyen, you did, I felt like, by that time, you know, I was brainy most, you can see that I, I was not stupid when I was growing up. <laughs> when you are a bit intelligent, yes, and you don't have a, a good background, you focus on your books so much, ne? not the boy stuff, because, you know, I felt like, by that time, I didn't even have a boyfriend. But to hear that I've done an abortion, apparently those were cysts. You see, the lack of knowledge. So I'm equating this thing of having babies or girls having discharges to saying we are engaging in sex, whereas it's the tight clothing that we are having. Then because of little knowledge, we throw accusations unknowingly, and that damages those kids a lot. Then thank you very much. I can see the comments. Businzi, I think some are saying that they can't hear. I don't know why from my, my, my students who are here. But I'm reading the last comment uh, from Sinobia, my fourth year student. Thank you, Doc, for sharing this with us. As one of your students, we had the honor to hear it in class, you know, um, testimony, the present one and this one as well. But I was listening to you as if I heard it for the first time. You were captivating. Thank you. <laughs> to keep IK alive, we need the elders. You said the student, fourth year student. Sinopia. And listen, when I said that culture unites, she's not of the Tosa culture, but from this process of enculturation, she sees value. We need to use them as our main source of information. We need to normalize sitting by fires and listening to stories again. They love my stories, but my stories are always relevant to science. I don't make stories for fun. <laughs> our, I, our aim is to keep IK alive. The fact that this information is spread through word of mouth you remember I said that? It is undocumented. As a researcher who knows it, and in science, I should write, because they would be asking where? It's not there. The fact that it is spread a true word of mouth and not documented makes it difficult for us to do research on our own. Bringing it into the classroom would not only make us feel accepted, but it would discover stuff about our culture that we did not even know. So a huge thank you. That's my student. Thank you very much, colleagues. Thank you so much, Ayanda. We, you've, you've dropped so many little, little snippets. We're gonna need to, we're gonna need to bring you back <laughs> to learn a little bit more. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming. There are a few snacks outside. Unfortunately, those who are online can't join us for those. Um, but um, please.
feel free to, to mingle. I'm sure Ayanda would still be answer questions as well. Yes, okay. Thank you. Just one thing. I'm seeing on the screen, I would fail if I can't acknowledge um, I, 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 in fact, my managers will have like for the Sermi a many scholarship I had. Um, here in Africa, it's managed by Prof. Paul Webb, the whole of it. Then we've got Center, the Urban for Sermi in Kenya, where we have students from Malawi and so on. So in Kenya, it is managed by Prof. John, John Chang, Chang Cha is here, and also Dr. Susan Kuchat. And then the coordinator in Germany is Dr. Malve von Mollendorf. You see the spelling. Then I'm also very excited that I'm supervising a student from Malawi who's studying uh, in, in Kenya in Moy University. That student, um, since I'm new, I'm a co-supervisor. The main supervisor is Professor Catherine Kiprop. She's here. Hence, I was pressing so much to have the online audience because I have an international community who would like to hear this. Yes, they hear sometimes when we present, but we get so little. But now we're touching bases. And obviously, the Eastern Cape uh, advisors are here. My family is here, my students. And we have from Nelson Mandela University, our public relations officer, we have a PR. I think he's going to be dropping this. We have a PR for the faculty, Tato Mushosha is here. And also, a professor who mentors me. I have various mentors, mentors in different, Professor Sina Musito. It's not easy these days to get a professor who takes you on board, but together running the NECT program. I'm just uh, highlighting a few, those that I could not see because the screen is not showing everything. Please don't feel offended, but I am pleased that you managed to join, ladies and gentlemen, and my community here. I'm part of you now. There's no way of you divorcing me. Thank you very much. Thank you. We are done. Thank you very much.